Hey everyone, this lesson is on macrocytic anemia. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what macrocytic anemia is. We're also gonna talk about an approach to macrocytic anemia, and we're also gonna talk about some of the causes of macrocytic anemia. So the first thing we wanna look at is a low hemoglobin level. So hemoglobin denoted as HGB. So a low hemoglobin level is anemia. What is a he low hemoglobin level? A low hemoglobin level is different depending on what patient you're looking at. In men, hemoglobin less than 13 grams per deciliter is considered anemia. In non-pregnant women, it's slightly different. Less than 12 grams per deciliter in non-pregnant women is considered a low hemoglobin or anemia. And less than 11 grams per deciliter in pregnant women is considered anemia or low hemoglobin. So when we see a low hemoglobin level below these thresholds, this is considered anemia. The next thing we want to look at is the MCV, mean corpuscular volume. This essentially tells us the average size of cells. So the normal range of an MCV is 80 to 100. If we were to see an MCV in this range between 80 to 100, this is considered normocytic anemia. Anything less than 80 on an MCV would be considered microcytic anemia. So smaller sized cells. If we see an MCV greater than 100, this is when we actually see macrocytic anemia. Once we have determined that this is a macrocytic anemia, there is a low hemoglobin and there's a high MCV greater than 100, we have to go a step further. We have to look at a blood smear looking at PMNs or polymorphonuclear leukocytes, things like neutrophils. So when we look at a neutrophil under the blood smear, if one of these PMNs or a neutrophil has greater than five lobes, that means that there is more than five pieces of the nucleus. This means that it is megaloblastic. If there's less than five lobes, it is non-megaloblastic. So I know that you might not know what these terms mean, but I'm gonna talk about more about these in the next slide. But this is a general quick overview of the approach to macrocytic anemia. So what does all of this mean? What does megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic mean? And what are the differences between the two? So first looking at macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. This can also be referred to as megaloblastosis. And what megaloblastic really means is that there are hypersegmented neutrophils. Remember we said there are more than five lobes on a neutrophil when we look at a blood smear. So what does that mean? So here is a hypersegmented neutrophil on a blood smear. So you can see here that the nucleus is hypersegmented. There are more than five lobes here. So more than five lobes means that this is megaloblastic. You might see some sources saying more than six lobes, but generally speaking, it's more than five lobes means it is a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. So what does all this mean? Why do I keep focusing on this aspect? What this really means is that there is impaired DNA synthesis. The nucleus in its formation has not been formed properly. There is an impaired or a disrupted synthesis of DNA. That is in contrast to non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. So non-megaloblastic simply means that when we look at neutrophils on a blood smear, they have less than five lobes. So you can see here is an example. What this is telling us is that there is no issue with DNA synthesis. So it's an anemia, so low hemoglobin, they're macrocytic, so they're larger, the MCV is greater than 100, but there's no issue with DNA synthesis. So this helps us determine the causes of what is happening, what is causing this macrocytic anemia. So we're gonna first talk about macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, some of the causes. I like to refer to these causes as the Ds, and you'll see what I mean here. Ds, the first D here is deficiencies. So the first one I'm gonna talk about here is folate deficiency. Folate deficiency can cause macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. We generally have weeks to six months of storage of folate in our liver. And the sources of folate come from leafy greens and fortified greens. So you can get this from leafy grains, but you can also get it from fortified grains. So you can get it from eating bread and cereal. So it's very difficult to actually have a deficiency in folate unless you are literally eating nothing at all. So some of the sources or some of the causes of folate deficiency 
include the following. Number one is reduced dietary intake. So I alluded to this before. Number two is compromised absorption. So anything that might be interfering with the absorption of folate, especially folate in the duodenum, so things like celiac disease could lead to a folate deficiency. We can also see it in impaired metabolism. So certain drugs can do this. And we can also see it in increased utilization. So increased utilization, we can see this in pregnancy. So pregnancy, you're creating more and more red blood cells. You're creating more blood cells. So you're using more folate. So you can actually get a deficiency of folate that way as well. The next D or the next deficiency is vitamin B12 deficiency. So vitamin B12 deficiency can be caused by several mechanisms. We generally have three to 10 years of storage in our liver. Sources of vitamin B12, generally speaking, are animal products. There are a couple of different ways you can get vitamin B12 deficiency. One is reduced dietary intake. So perhaps a vegan who is not supplementing their diet appropriately. And number two is compromised absorption. So you can see this in things like pernicious anemia. You're not actually able to absorb B12 properly. What is important to recognize in vitamin B12 deficiency is that it can lead to neurological symptoms. So you can get things like paresthesias. You can also get issues with proprioception and two-point discrimination. So I have a whole lesson on vitamin B12 deficiency. Please check out that lesson if you want more information on that topic. I also have a lesson on folate deficiency as well if you want more information. So now that we know that folate and vitamin B12 deficiency both cause macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, how do we distinguish between the two? How do we know which one's actually causing the macrocytic megaloblastic anemia? So there's a couple ways you can look at this. We can look at folate levels and vitamin B12 levels. So if we're seeing folate levels that are very, very low and normal vitamin B12 levels, then that is basically telling us that this is a folate deficiency. If we're seeing the opposite, if we're seeing normal or high levels of folate, but a very low level of vitamin B12, that can also indicate that vitamin B12 is causing the macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. But what if they're kind of both on the lower end of normal? How do you know which one's actually causing the megaloblastic macrocytic anemia? So one way is to look at methylmalonic acid. This is a good approach anyway, just to rule out vitamin B12 deficiency as a cause of macrocytic megaloblastic anemia because it can have irreversible neurological symptoms anyways. So if we look at a methylmalonic acid and it's high, that is telling us that we have a vitamin B12 deficiency. If it is a normal methylmalonic acid, that is telling us that it is a folate deficiency that's causing the macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. So again, once we've figured out that we have macrocytic anemia, we look at the neutrophils on a blood smear if they're hypersegmented, meaning more than five or six lobes, that is megaloblastic. And we look at methylmalonic acid to distinguish between is it caused by vitamin B12 deficiency or is it caused by folate deficiency? You could also look at folate and vitamin B12 levels anyways to distinguish between the two. But if vitamin B12 and folate levels are equivocal, which means that you don't actually know which one is actually causing this macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, you can look at a methylmalonic acid. So you look at a methylmalonic acid level. If it's high, it means that it is vitamin B12 deficiency. If it's normal, it means that it is folate deficiency. So folate deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency aren't the only causes of macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Remember that mnemonic I told you, the Ds are the causes of macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. The other Ds here are the DNA affecting drugs. So the first one here is methotrexate. Methotrexate can lead to a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Another one is azathioprine. Septra or sulfa Antibiotics like septra or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole can also do this as well. Antivirals like zidovudine, antiepileptics like phenytoin and phenobarbital can also lead to macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Chemotherapies can also lead to macrocytic megaloblastic anemia as well, including 5-fluorouracil. It can impair DNA synthesis, leading to a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Hydroxyurea can also do this. Cytosine, cladribine. And capacitabine can also do this as well. Others include pyrimethamine and sulfazalazine, as well as triamterine. So all of these can lead to a macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, in addition to vitamin B12 and folate deficiencies. 
So now that we know the causes of macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, what are some of the causes of macrocytic non-megaloblastic anemia? So we break the causes down into categories. The first is endocrine. So hypothyroidism can actually cause a macrocytic non-megaloblastic anemia, so low thyroid functioning. Another category of causes is genetic. So genetic can be anything from inherited to acquired. So one inherited cause is hereditary spherocytosis. And another one is Down syndrome. So both of these can cause issues with macrocytic non-megaloblastic anemia. An acquired cause is myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. And another one is proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. There's also some reactive causes that can cause macrocytic non-megaloblastic anemia. Some of these include reticulocytosis. So reticulocytosis is essentially a surge of younger red blood cells. These cells are going to be larger in size, so that's why we see a high MCV. So we see a lot of reticulocytes, and this can be due to a couple of different causes. There could be high turnover, so some kind of a hemolytic anemia. There could be some issue with blood loss, so the bone marrow is pumping out more reticulocytes. So we can see it from reactive causes. And some other causes of macrocytic non-megaloblastic anemia include pregnancy. So actually pregnancy is related to reticulocytosis. We see more reticulocytes being present in pregnant females. Liver disease is also a big one here. So if an individual has liver disease, that can cause macrocytic non-megaloblastic anemia. And another one is alcoholism. So alcoholism itself, even without liver disease, can also cause this as well. So what I really want you to take away from this slide, a lot of stuff here, hypothyroidism, liver disease, and alcoholism are some of the biggest ones you're going to see. And some of the other ones, if you don't really see those, you can think of these other causes as well. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on macrocytic anemia. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.